The Judo Chop Suey podcast is presented by Health IQ, a life insurance agency that helps health conscious people lower their rates on their life insurance. Are you someone who takes care of their health and fitness and takes special care of themselves through proper nutrition? Do you lift weights or take part of a physical activity like judo? And I'm sure many of you listening do. Then visit www.healthiq.com forward slash judo to learn more about Health IQ special rates for active people like you and me. 56% of Health IQ customers save between 4 and 33% on their life insurance, and these savings are exclusive to Health IQ customers. So if you want to learn more about how Health IQ can help you save on your life insurance, visit www.healthiq.com forward slash judo to get a free rate quote and to learn more about Health IQ's special rates. Greetings and salutations to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Judo Chop Suey Podcast, and I'm your host, Judo Dave Roman. How you doing? Good? Alrighty then. As always, I'm very happy to be back behind the microphone to talk all things judo and some things other topics. I feel like I got a lot to cover today, but I'm not sure how it's going to go. I'm just sitting here winging it a little bit. Uh, somewhat. I, I do take a little bit of notes here and there when I prepare for the podcast, but I don't write anything down. I just kind of have some highlights on what I want to discuss, and then I just kind of wing it from there. So we're going to see how this goes, because that's typically how I do. On this episode, I want to talk a little bit of uh, some IJF-related breaking news that will definitely affect the outcome of one of the divisions in the IJF uh, World Judo Championships. I also want to discuss some pretty interesting things that I found out when taking a look at Google Trends. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar. Oh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Google, but Google has a lot of sub related sub sites. I don't know. or I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but they've got a lot of sub sites and Google Trends is one of those sites that maybe not as many people know about. And I, I was just messing around on Google Trends and saw some interesting trends that I think is worth discussing. I also want to discuss my new judo-related affiliation. And when I mean affiliation, I'm not talking about a, a podcast affiliation. I'm talking more of a personal affiliation. I, I want to discuss what that is and what that means for me moving forward. Uh, it means nothing for this podcast. But for me personally, it could mean a great deal. I also want to discuss a little bit about stiff arming in judo. And I'm not going to go into a technical breakdown per se on this episode, but I just want to give my thoughts on experiences with people who stiff arm and the times that I used to stiff arm myself and, you know, when, when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. And as usual, I'll discuss whatever it is that comes up on my mind, uh, starting with some of my housekeeping items. And for those of you who are new to the podcast, the housekeeping items are is a section of the podcast where I talk about things that are not related to judo. I try and keep it short. I also uh, will read some email uh, that I received, kind of a, a, a little humorous one, so I, I, I can't wait to share it. But first, in terms of housekeeping items, I think I officially binge watch my first show of anything. And I, you know, when I mean binge watch, I mean I'm talking about watching four episodes in a row and every little break I have in between doing nothing or whatever the case may be, I'm watching an episode or, or watching part of an episode. Cobra Kai finally dropped on YouTube Red and I thought it was fantastic. Now, for those who may not be aware, maybe some of you younger people in the crowd, Cobra Kai is a continuing story of Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence from the original Karate Kid in 1983, 1984. That movie came out when I was eight years old, and I've said it before in this podcast, I'll say it again. It was the movie that inspired me to have an interest in traditional martial arts in general. Now, I don't want to give away too much about the show, but I gotta say, I thought the show was fantastic. And I thought William Zabka, who portrayed, who reprised his role as Johnny Lawrence, was tremendous in this show. I just, I wasn't sure what I was going to get with this show. I thought maybe 
it would just be kind of a, a silly ham-fisted throwback to an 80s uh, movie. And it had some elements of that. I, I think the show went to the nostalgia well a little bit too much. But William Zabka portrays Johnny Lawrence as a kind of a 35 years later, down on his luck type of guy who who really apparently fell from grace significantly from losing just one match in a tournament. But Johnny's character reopens the Cobra Kai, the Cobra Kai dojo, and and it really becomes a story of redemption for that character and for a bunch of other characters in the show that eventually become his students. I I just thought it was really well done. Uh, Ralph Macchio uh, reprises his role as Daniel LaRusso. I thought he did a good job. I, I took a little exception. I, I, I shouldn't even be annoyed by this kind of things, but but Ralph Macchio took top billing in, in the show, and I don't think it should have been him. It should have been William Zabka because William Zabka was the star of the show because it's about Cobra Kai. It's not about uh, Daniel LaRusso. But other than that, and maybe other than going to the nostalgia well a little bit too much, the show was solid top to bottom. I highly recommend it. It's not hard to binge watch because none of the episodes are really much longer than a half hour. And totally worth it. I, I highly recommend you just get YouTube Red for a month and watch the show and then cancel. Because, come on, who really pays for YouTube Red? Really? This weekend, I also saw Avengers Infinity War. Finally, this is the movie that I've been waiting for for quite some time. I was a little bit hesitant, hoping that it was going to deliver. Because, look, quite frankly, this is almost like sacrilege to say, but I thought the original Avengers movie was a little bit overrated. And I also thought Age of Ultron was kind of a dull, uh, a dud. But and I so I was a little bit hesitant about gosh how are you gonna fit the Guardians of the Galaxy and the Avengers in this in this movie plus introducing Thanos as a character not introducing but having him as a main character and and yada 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 but the movie delivered I mean it was it perfect no it wasn't perfect but I thought it was a fantastic movie I highly recommend you guys watch it I I, I really don't want to say more than that because I'm afraid that I might spoil it for some of you so I'm just gonna keep. I'm going to keep myself tight-lipped on it. But it was good. It, it was it was really excellent. I would highly recommend before you go watch the movie, maybe go to some website or see some kind of summary. Or if you're really crazy, just watch every single Marvel Cinematic Universe movie over the past 10 years. But you might want to remind yourself what the you know some of these key objects are. You know, the Infinity Stones and how all of this interacts with all the Marvel movies over the past 10 plus years or really about 10 years or so with Iron Man in 2008. So I would highly recommend before watching this movie, if you're not really caught up with everything that's going on in that universe, just just get a brief synopsis of what who the characters are and, and what ha- is happening and that kind of thing. So, But once you do that, go watch the movie, enjoy it, and definitely stay all the way through the credits, which seemed the credits this time seemed like it was 20 minutes long. Uh, but but at the end, there is a, a bonus scene. Only one bonus scene, but it's a bonus scene worth watching. All right, let's see what else is going on with me. Oh, I had pretty good uh, pretty good week of training in judo. I went to my club, Riverview Judo, on Friday. And then Saturday morning, I went to Ybor City Jiu-Jitsu to do their no-gi class again. And, and, and this is tremendous. I, I'm sure some of you who follow me on Instagram already know. And if you're not following me on Instagram, what the hell is the matter with you? It's at La Vida Judoka. My Instagram is awesome, especially because you would get treated to a picture of me and former WWE champion Jack Swagger was at Ybor City Jiu-Jitsu. I got to, to actually, I didn't actually roll with him, but we were doing the no-gi class and it was just kind of surreal that, you, uh, you know, Judo Joe, my buddy, he had asked me to to uh, demonstrate a little bit the differences of Hizuguruma and and uh, Sasai Surikomiyashi, you know, just to the Noki class. So it was kind of surreal, like I'm I'm showing these techniques and I'm I'm teaching freaking Jack Swagger <laughs> on how to do this stuff, and it was pretty neat. It just was really cool. He's a really cool guy. He, yeah, I, I went right up to him. I was like, Hey, I know who you who you are. It's a real pleasure meeting you. He said. 
nice meeting you too. You know, just call me Jake. Cause that's what he goes by. He goes by Jake. So I, I didn't call him. I didn't actually call him Jack Swagger once. I just basically acknowledged that I knew who he was. And, um, and we talked for a little bit. He's a really nice guy. He brought in some free food, free frozen food that I took home. So, so he, not only did he take a picture with me, he gave me some food. So I'm very grateful for, to him, and I'm very grateful for the people at Ybor City. Had an excellent workout. And when we did our Nogi Rondori, there's a fellow who, um, who I trained with previously two weeks ago who is a, a former high school wrestler, very skilled on the mat. And I told him, look, man, you know, yeah, well, this is no gi judo. I don't care. I, I don't care if you were trying to throw me on my back. I want you to take me down by as uh, any means necessary. Just do what you do best. And he did. <laughs> he he took me down quite a bit. Uh, grappling with a wrestler, you know, with my judo skills in, in the no gi. It's a very different experience. I, I'll definitely talk about this in the future once I, um, I, I kind of want to do it in a more formal way. Not not oh I don't want to call it like judo versus wrestling. I just want to be able to give my impressions on it because I I, I want to be a overall better grappler and I that's what I told this young man. Um, I gosh he, he might actually be lighter than me, which would be shocking. But yeah, I mean there were a couple of throws I got him on. Uh, you know managed to get him on his back, but. Doing wrestling with a wrestler with judo skills is a very different experience, especially especially without the gi, and especially when you take away um, the goal of throwing somebody on their back. Now, I, I mean, I was trying to throw him on his back with everything that I was doing, but I told him, look, pick up my leg, throw me on my stomach. I don't care what, just take me down. And he did. I, I got I to gotta give him credit. Uh, hey. Granted, he's younger than me and he's faster, but it doesn't matter. I wanted to be challenged. I wanted to try something different, and I was grateful. I was grateful for the experience, and I hope to get to do it again soon. And after that sparring session, I decided to do some work, uh, believe it or not, on Nage no Kata with Judo Joe. It's something that I have not practiced in, gosh, I, I, I'm almost ashamed to admit it, so I'm not going to. But we spent the first three, uh, or we spent the fir- uh, f- about 45 minutes or so working on the f- first three techniques of Nage no Kata. And I got to say, I, I was rusty and it did not look good at all. I just, yikes. But I want to get back to a level where I can demonstrate it proficiently. And, you know, given that I'm getting older, you know. And trust me, I'm not saying that Kata is just for older people. But believe me, that's not my point. My point is that through kata practice, I do think my overall judo can improve. And I, I want to get back to doing that. And, and sometimes I feel the need to mix it up and take a break from the normal way that I do things. So I, I wanted to mix it up and, and, and practice a different way and, and approach techniques in a different way. So so that's something that I'm going to be committing myself to uh, for the foreseeable future, at least until I get uh, proficient at it again because like I said it's been years since I've done any practice with Nagi no Kata and I just I just want to get back to it you know okay so what's next here oh yeah it's time for my favorite segment of the Judo Chop Suey podcast what time is it listener reaction all right so I got this email a couple of days ago and I thought um I found it a little bit humorous uh, I'll read it to you guys and I'm sure you guys will find the humor in it as well and to the to the person who sent me the email, please understand I'm not poking fun at you. Just um, just needed to clarify a few things for for the audience here and for and for you. All right, so here it goes. Hi, Judo Dave. Just shooting you a quick email to let you know, uh, listening to your great podcast and keep up the great work. And at 35 years old, li- living in Central Queensland, Australia, I've started trading judo. It's great fun. Wish I took it up years ago. It's a small club in. Uh, Blackwater, Queensland called Blackwater Kodokan Judo with my sensei. Uh, great club with a great group of guys and girls. Thank you for keeping me informed of what's going on in the world of Judo. Cheers. And then I sent the email back saying, oh yeah, I remember you. You wrote me you know, a year ago. And I, I, at that point, I had recognized the name because at the time he had sent me an email saying he doesn't even didn't even do Judo, but but he just liked listening to the podcast. So I was very, very appreciative of that. And then he writes me back, says... You know, so he's like, yeah, that's me. You have an excellent memory. I didn't realize judo 
had so much Brazilian jiu-jitsu in it in the form of Nawaza. It was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, that, that that's a surprise to me too. I, I didn't realize uh, judo had so much Brazilian jiu-jitsu in it. I, that, completely surprising. And come to find out, it turns out judo really stole a lot from Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Like, for example, there's a technique in Brazilian uh, in, in judo called Ude Garami. Well, Helio Gracie invented that arm lock and called it the Kimura. I mean, it's really hard to tell who invented what between the two martial arts, but but if there's a couple of things I'm very certain about is that judo stole a lot from Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Helio Gracie invented the Kimura. All right, yeah, 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 I know. Ha, ha, yeah, very funny. Look, you, you look, I'm kidding around, Ost Nation. Don't, don't get upset at me. Don't yell at me or whatever. Just a big joke. That no one's finding funny. And to you, anonymous emailer, please understand that I'm just kind of joking around here. But I think it does point out something interesting that many people who are interested in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or practice Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu really do not know the actual history of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo. And I, I, that's not for me to get into on this, on this podcast or this particular episode. I'm not going to go there. Because I that that history is well documented and it is, you know, it is what it is. And that's that's just Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You know, the the too long didn't read version of it. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu did come from Judo. There's a lot of similarities today, but the, but there are many, many differences as well. It, it, but not so much in, in the approach to training. That is pretty uniform between Judo and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. What works is what's used and what doesn't work gets thrown out, basically. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu may not have kata, but they've got plenty of drills. And I've talked about that before, that kata, you could also view kata as a form of drilling. Even though it's not quite the same, but it, it is a form of drilling the techniques that you already know. Now, speaking of Judo and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, there's a topic that I want to bring up for discussion. And it's a topic that I have talked about in the past. I wouldn't go as far as saying ad nauseum. But it's something that I've discussed before, and, and, and I revisited it recently in terms of viewing statistics. Okay, here we go again. The popularity of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu compared to Judo. Now, I know, yeah, I know, there you go, Luke Skywalker screaming no. I get it. But a couple of days ago, I was on the Google Trends website and I'm not sure why initially I landed on that site. I think I was interested in looking at the trends for some other type of topic. But, of course, immediately when I was looking at the trends for another topic, I was thinking to myself, ah, I wonder, wonder what the trend is on judo compared to other subjects and other traditional martial arts and other sports like Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Now, if you've never been on the uh, the Google Trends website, you can do a search on specific search terms or you can do a search on the subject matter itself. Now, to be absolutely clear about Google Trends, even though it does provide worldwide data, I'm almost certain that the data provided is based on the actual search term used. So, for example, in Japanese, judo is... is um, or the search term judo is not written out in English. They probably you know, people who go to to www.google.jp that would probably be the website for Japan, I would guess. So what I'm trying to say is that people searching in their non-English language, the search terminology is not going to count. I have no idea how to type Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Japanese. Uh, I certainly know how to do it in Judo, but I would have to copy and paste it from an image somewhere. Anyway, so I want to be clear that everything that I'm saying is in regards to searching Judo versus Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the English language. And the results, as you would imagine, I found were, were interesting but predictable. And I was interested to see what the numbers are for not only these four countries because they are <laughs> the largest the largest of my audience but these countries are predominantly english speaking countries and as i've mentioned before brazilian jiu jitsu is far and away more popular in the united states in canada in the uk and in australia 
and that's more popular in terms of search terminology. And you know, I'm not necessarily talking about national governing body membership numbers in this instance. I'm just talking about the Google Trends and what the trend is in terms of searches. Now, something I found very interesting for all four of these countries is that there is a huge, and I mean huge, spike in popularity for judo around the Olympics. And then it goes right back down to its normal number. So what does that mean to me? And to be clear, it goes back down to its normal number while I still see Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu's search terminology, uh, you know, the number rising little by little over the course of, and I did a search over the course of five years. You can actually see the data all the way back from 2004. So when I see that spike and then it comes immediately crashing down to earth, it kind of tells me that in these four countries, the national governing bodies are not really capitalizing on judo's interest for that two-week window. Now, what's interesting to me is that when I move the data to all the way back to 2004, it seems in the United States, Brazilian jiu-jitsu overtook judo in terms of Google Trends back in August around 2005. That was right around the time where the separation in terms of popularity of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo uh, started. That's where that separation started, where judo, I mean, it was already declining back to 2004, but in, in a, a, as a, sli it, you see the terminology and the interest sliding on a downward scale for, where Brazilian jiu-jitsu is sliding on an upward scale. What's really interesting to me is seeing the UK's numbers is that that same thing happened at much more recently. It seems that in the UK in December of 2015, that's when the separation started where Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu became more popular in the minds of internet searchers than Judo. And, and we see, you see that you see that back in 2004, the divide was pretty solid between judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu where judo was far more popular. But you see that, that downward slide, just like if you look at a, at a stock chart over the course of five years, you, you look at how a stock's value goes up and down and then you put your plot lines or whatever the case may be, however you want to analyze those graphs. Well, it's not much different with judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu when it comes to the UK. You see that, that steady decline going downwards while with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu it goes upwards and, and that like I said that crossing point where Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu quote-unquote overtook Judo was December of 2015. Now for Canada that happened back in May 2009 and the decline doesn't look quite as sharp as it does for the UK and the United States but right around May of 2009 is when Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, in terms of interest from internet users, started overtaking Judo in Canada. And for Australia, it seems like there's been a, if you want to call it a battle, going all the way back to December 2004 is when Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu first overtook Judo in terms of an interest. But then Judo overtook Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in terms of interest for a number of years. But it seems like in January of 2009, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu's interest became greater than Judo's and it's never looked back ever since. And that divide is growing significantly, almost as large as the divide in the United States. Now, I've, as I mentioned before, interest in Judo spikes significantly in all of these countries around the Olympics. So you see, you see the trend points for 2008. 2012 and 2016 as as interest in all th all four of those countries spike significantly and that's obviously because of the Olympics but it does come crashing down now look I understand that's probably you could say the same thing for a lot of other sports I probably uh, wrestling sees the same type of spikes the decathlon probably sees those kind of spikes but what's more concerning to me is the numbers of active participants uh, at least recorded in the national governing bodies. So I know I've said this before. I don't like using online discussions as as fodder for podcast material. But every once in a while I come across topics that are pretty interesting. And I, I saw something recently. And this was a discussion 
about judo numbers in the United States. And, and we all, well, not we, but but it was estimated, and I think it's a fair number, that there are probably only about 30,000 or so active participating judoka in the United States. And what else I thought I saw was interesting in that same discussion is that in the UK, that number is about 30,000 if you're just talking about the BJA. And that was very surprising to me because I would have guessed that that number would have been at least double. Now, granted, the UK is a much smaller country than the United States and, and doesn't have anywhere near the population size. So their per capita numbers are much higher compared to the United States. But still, only 30,000 active, actively registered participants in the BJA. That's very surprising. Now, I don't know what Australia's number is or what Canada's number is, but I can't imagine, given the divide, of interest in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu versus Judo, that those numbers are are any different. Oh, and I forgot to mention this real quick. Shout out to all my peeps out in Ireland. I shouldn't forget you guys either. I know you're a large country, and the discussion applies to you too. So I, I, I'm also seeing the divide of Judo and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu's popularity is overtaking Judo's popularity in your country. Now, before I continue with that train of thought, I want to take a moment to talk about the presenters of this podcast, Health IQ. Health IQ wants to recognize your hard work and dedication to a fit and healthy lifestyle by offering you savings on your life insurance. Health IQ is a life insurance agency that helps health conscious people like many of you listening to this podcast to get lower rates on their life insurance. According to a 2009 study in the International Journal of Sports Medicine, Men who did high-intensity exercise have a 35% lower risk of all-cause mortality. For women, the risk reduction is 44%. By having an active and healthy lifestyle, Health IQ can get you lower rates on your life insurance policy if you qualify. Visit www.healthiq.com forward slash judo to learn more and to see if you can qualify for a lower rate on your life insurance. Now, for shits and giggles, I decided to take a look at another country that has a large English-speaking population, in, and that would be India. As I understand it from people that I've worked with over the past 20 years in IT, uh, every state in India, most people speak English uh, along with their local dialects. So I decided to give a search on India, and, well, not to my surprise, uh, judo is more popular in India than Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I can't imagine Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at this moment having a very strong presence in India. But I got to believe there's some states in India that do have uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu clubs. Now look, I understand that Judo is popular in, in a lot of other places around the world. And I do understand that the world doesn't stop and start in the United States. I get that. But here is my, uh, my general point. Four of the world's top 10 economies, and that's including California as a separate economy, we are seeing a sharp decline in judo, and we are losing the battle of interest when it comes to judo versus Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And if judo's future is going to be insured, there has to be a way. The IJF has to find a way to generate more interest in these countries. Now, look, Australia may not be in the top 10 of, of world economies, but they're number 13 as far as I can find out, as far as the information that I have. They're number 13, so they're not a tiny country in terms of, of their economy either. And the reason why I'm bringing up the economy aspect of this stuff is that, look, these countries that I've just mentioned, they have a lot of resources. There's a lot of people that can pump money into judo and into the IJF and look more money pumped into the sport just means more money to be spread around to everybody else I I don't can't remember if I've mentioned this ever but you, you know the the prize pools considering you know for as popular as people say judo is across the world the prize pools are pretty paltry in comparison to other sports out there that other kids and, and, and young adults can, could choose to do. There are parents out there that have aspirations for their children to compete at the highest level in sports because that generates a lot of money. So when 
let's say a parent takes a look at judo and compares that to golf, they see, okay, well, in judo, you win a tournament, you you can win up to $100,000. But in golf, if you win a tournament, you can win over a million dollars. Huh, which sport am I going to put my kid into? And I know I talked about this, I definitely know I talked about this last year, is that the IGF claims they have over a billion viewers. And if that's the case, if that's the case on a global scale, then they are definitely not paying their athletes enough, the top people. And I look, I know at that level, athletes have their own sponsorships as well. But the IJF has strict rules and regulations about sponsorship ads on a player's judogi. Unlike Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where they can cram as many sponsorship patches as, as you, you, you can. You can't do that in judo. And, and that's probably a good thing. I mean, even in the NBA, you have sponsorship uh, patches on, on their jerseys, but they're not all over the jerseys. They're, they're discreet. They're, they're tastefully done. So I, I, I understand that, that the IGF needs to go that same route. So getting back to participation numbers and interest... Something very interesting when I looked at the numbers for Germany, I did the search based on topic results and and not actual search terms. So so what I found interesting when looking at the trends from 2004, judo is more popular in Germany than Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But guess what? It's trending downward. And guess what's trending upward in Germany? Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And again, doing a topic search, Guess what's trending in Sweden? Guess what the trends look like in the Netherlands? And guess what that trend looks like in Spain? I mean, I could keep going. The IJF cannot turn a blind eye to this, and neither should we. And to be absolutely clear, this is not one of those we much save judo from the clutches of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That's not my point at all. My point is that us recreational folks, us older guys, us... Younger guys who may be who may have come into judo in their 20s or, or mid 20s or, or even early 30s, whatever the case may be, we have a big responsibility to ensure that that judo doesn't just fade into obscurity. And I'm talking about the main countries that I've already discussed, the aforementioned countries, you know, the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Australia. We don't have to be great competitors or, or have a great competition record to be able to give back to to judo as a whole. And that's a reason why I do this podcast, because I want to be able to give back in my own silly way that I do on this hideous podcast. But it's my way of trying to give back, even though I'm still technically a student. I'm only a showdown, like I said. I am working to become a better judoka. I'm I'm looking to learn more, and I'm looking to be a better student. And I think through that way and through those means, I can continue to get better and eventually be able to to share that knowledge with other people who may have different grappling experiences or, or, or may even want to try judo just once and, and see what it's like. So to that end, and I, I teased this earlier in the podcast, I have decided to become part of AAU Judo and become associated with the Judo Black Belt Association. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be a, a member of USA Judo moving forward. That's not what it means. But what it means to me is being part of a smaller grassroots related organization that probably, no, definitely focuses on a brand of judo that better reflects my long-term goals. Because my long-term goals is not in competition. And I could be wrong about the USJF and the USJA, but I know for sure the USA, you know, USA Judo conforms to, and really, quite frankly, they have to conform to IGF rules. And what's interesting to me is that when I started this podcast, oh gosh, a year and a half ago, my very first episode was all about defending the IJF's ban on leg grabs. That's what that very, very first episode was about. And this podcast has allowed me to interact with so many of you listening. Uh, Maybe some of you don't listen anymore, but... (laughs) But a lot of you have written over the past year and a half and, you know, given me a different perspective, challenged my thoughts, and made me rethink things. Now, to be clear, I still do support the leg grab ban in international judo competitions. But many of you that have written to me over the past year and a half, uh, when it comes to everybody else, I look, I my my opinion on that has changed. I think you guys are right. 
and look, my decision to join the AAU Judo and, and, the, and the Judo Black Belt Association does not have to do with leg grabs. It has more to do with being a part of an organization that truly focuses on grassroots level Judo and really focuses on teaching all of Judo. I mean, do you guys realize I haven't done Kataguruma other than the other day when I was practicing Nagi no Kata. I haven't actually done Kataguruma in eight years. And I'm talking about traditional kata guruma. Haven't done it in eight years. Which I just let the cat out of the bag was probably the last time I worked on Nage no Kata. <laughs> but you know what I mean? AAU Judo runs their freestyle judo tournaments. We've talked about freestyle judo in the past. I've had uh, Sensei Steve Scott on the, the, the podcast twice now. And, and um, like, I, like I said a couple of months ago, his his episode on freestyle judo is probably one of my more... Uh, popular episodes that I've had. It's, it's worth listening to. And I know AAU Judo also runs uh, judo tournaments that are not freestyle judo, but still retain the the older rules from prior to the 2010 changes. So you still have judo tournaments that still call Yukos and Coca. You know, and one of the things that I really love about what Steve Scott and that organization is doing is that they are very inclusive to older adults and really just, and when I mean older adults, I mean beginners starting at 21 and up, you know, in your thirties and your forties and such. I mean, look at their videos and, and look who they're teaching. It's not elite athletes. It's not, you know, young teenagers and there's nothing wrong with teaching elite athletes and young TJ teenagers. Don't get me wrong. But they seem very inclusive. And I just think that's so important for tr ha truly having a grassroots judo growth. So after I had Steve Scott on in March, I, I started thinking about, gosh, you know, he's really doing a lot of good things. He has a great YouTube channel. I mean, I, I, I subscribe to that thing. Anytime he puts out a video, it dings on my phone and I go watch the latest stuff because he, he really is one of the few people out there that puts a tremendous effort in providing free content on YouTube for judo specific instruction. And not only that, he does a lot of no gi stuff. He does a lot of sambo uh, 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 videos on his channel. And quite frankly, he does a lot of things that you cannot do in IJF competitions. And that's not to say that IJF competitions are bad. No, I'm, I'm going to keep watching them. I'm going to keep reviewing them on this podcast. But in terms of my own judo development and where I would like to be in 10 years and what kind of skill set I would like to have in 10 years, I just don't think for me, practicing judo in a way that conforms to IJF competition rules, it's, it's just not for me anymore. And it's, it's been a long process since I started this podcast to get to this point. But AAU Judo focuses on the totality of teaching Kodokan Judo. And that's really what I want to be a part of. So I've decided to to join that organization, and I'm I'm very proud of that. And I want to continue to support that as best as I can. And like I've said, I'm a fan of Steve Scott's work. I'm a fan of what he's doing at his club. I'm a fan of what he's doing with with uh, freestyle judo. And like like I said, I just want to be a part of it, and I want to support it. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got breaking news. <laughs> All right, maybe this isn't breaking by the time you hear it, but I can confidently announce there will be a new World Judo Champion in the plus 100 kilo division this year. Will it be Guram Tushishvili? Will it be Lucas Kapralik? Or David Mora? Whoever it is, it's not going to be Teddy Renner. Now, the IJF made this news official on their Twitter account uh, a few days ago, and... JudoInside.com expanded on the report. Not only is Teddy Renner going to take the 2018 World Championships off, he is also not going to compete in the 2019 World Championships either. And I would venture to guess that given he only competed twice last year, which was in the World Championships and the, uh, the World Open Championships, I can't imagine that he's going to compete in any tournament over the next two years. 
Heck, at this point, I'm not even sure if he's going to compete in the Olympics in Tokyo. Because right now, it's it's very obvious that he is focused on the Paris Games in 2024. And it's interesting to me to see him take, uh, take an advance, maybe not advanced approach, but he's really trying to micromanage his career so that he can win a world championship in 2024. I'm sorry, an Olympic medal in 2024. In front of his hometown. I think that it's really important to him. And we see this in a lot of other sports. Where as an athlete gets older. Instead of running them down into the ground. Coaches and organizations manage their careers. They they manage their minutes. I see this in the NBA a lot. That that coaches will manage a player's career. So they can play uh, effectively uh, almost into their 40s. Most recently, I'm thinking of future NBA Hall of Famer Tim Duncan who played for the San Antonio Spurs in the NBA for those who are not familiar with basketball. His career was managed or was micromanaged over the past maybe four or five years prior to his retirement. There would be games that that he would be sat out completely. Uh, His minutes were being reduced. His his offensive opportunities and who he was playing with was, was managed. So... I'm going to guess that Teddy Renner and his coach, uh, Frank Shambili, have a long-term game plan to make sure that Teddy is at his absolute best at 35 years old, which is what he'll be in 2024. Now, I can't imagine that he's going to skip the Tokyo Olympics because he wants to maintain that, that winning streak of his in the Olympics and get another gold medal. So... Well, now that I think of it, he's got to compete at some point, doesn't he? He he still needs the points. Now, Grant, right now he's, if I'm not mistaken, he's ranked fourth in the over uh, 100 kilo division. But what's going to happen is that points eventually fall off. And you need the competition points to get into the Olympics. Now, I don't know if there are special exceptions for former world champions or former uh, uh, Olympic champions, but... If he's got to follow the same rules as everybody else, he's going to have to compete at some point if he wants to go to the Tokyo Games. I would think. I could be very wrong on that. I'm not sure. Hopefully somebody out there can correct me on those details. But by the time 2024 rolls around, he's going to be elderly in terms of uh, uh, elite judoka because that that's really old. And granted, if there's anybody who could do it and win at that level... At that age, it is Teddy Renner. So we'll see how it goes. But without question, there will definitely be a new world champion in the plus 100 kilo division. If I were going to bet on that, and maybe I will, I would go with uh, my favorite to watch in that division, Gurum Tushishvili. So I want to talk a little bit about stiff arming in judo. Now, stiff arming in judo stopped becoming a thing for me like a decade ago, but I realize there are many of you out there who may be beginners or, or, or intermediate players that deal with the stiff armor and sometimes you don't really know what to do or, or maybe the best approach to that. Or maybe you're a stiff armor yourself and perhaps, you know, you're trying to break that habit and, you know, or, or maybe you're struggling in Rondori because you do a lot of stiff arming. So I just want to talk a little bit about stiff arming in general. I'm not going to talk about specific things you can do to defeat the stiff arm because I think that's best done in a dojo or or even watching a YouTube video. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up a little bit is because I watched a video put up by Travis Stevens on his fantastic blog. And it was about uh, defeating the stiff arm, certainly one of many ways to do it. Now, for me, when there's a couple of ways that throughout the years I've always tried to defeat the stiff arm. And for one, that's just by being a better grip fighter and refusing to have anyone get both grips on me. And especially on the on the lapel. I always, you know, in practice, I, when I was practicing, practicing grip fighting or dealing with a stiff armor, I simply would just remove their lapel grip off of me and ensure that I always had a two-on-one situation where they were just left with with holding on to the sleeve and, and and that was that that's usually how I dealt with it or I would pop that grip off and and 
make them bend over so I can take an over the back grip. And, and that was always a good way to, to deal with stiff arming for me as well. So, I mean, I, I have a lot of gripping strategies that I've always employed to deal with stiff armors. And, but that was years ago. These days, I don't really grip fight as much because, I'm tr- quite frankly, I'm trying to save on my fingers. I've got arthritis in, in both of my hands, and it's not severe by any means. But constant grip fighting for me is just more – it's just really a thing of the past. I, I am trying to solve problems and challenges in judo without relying on grip fighting or just fighting for my grip or – Or getting my preferred grip or anything like that. A lot of times when I'm doing Rondori, since it's just practice, I like working from the sleeve lapel grip and and trying to stay loose in my arms. It's it's very important for me to work on sleeve lapel and try and improve my judo in that way because it is more challenging. And a lot of times when working with bigger or heavier people, it's, it's given me opportunities to try and find solutions without going to my old bag of tricks and it's harder it's harder a lot of times I find myself getting thrown in situations where I may normally not get thrown if I was doing some grip fighting and such so so for me when these days when I deal with a stiff armor I am looking at angles I am looking to create angles I'm looking to attack angles and get those arms moving in a different direction instead of straight at me so for me, that involves a lot of movement and circling. That involves a lot of playing with people's balances. You know, sometimes I may have a um, a high collar lapel grip, and I'll just yank a little bit, not yank hard at all, but but subtly yank on the lapel a little bit to get a reaction. And then I use that reaction maybe to change directions or even use that to attack. Because it's very hard if you... Even if you if you have, like, let's say a double lapel grip on somebody and you're just trying to hold on to them and they don't even need a grip on you, but you're you're just moving around. And it, now, granted, look, I'm talking about beginner stiff arming, but you could you could try this out for yourself. Let somebody just grip you and let them hold on while you move around as fast as you can. You know, shifting from side to side, circling, going forward and backwards. It's very hard for a person to maintain that stiff arm grip. They're eventually going to break their posture. They're eventually going to lose their balance. So these are the kind of challenges that I look for whenever I deal with a stiff armor. I don't I just don't rely on grip fighting anymore. I, I try and and um find ways to deal with it by attacking certain angles and through movement and through circling and through ashiwaza. It all depends where I stand, but that's kind of where I'm looking to do right now. And I think the last time I did Rondori with my sensei, he, he tends to take a, a, a like a very because he's a little bit taller than me and he and he's bigger than me, and he's a lefty, so he tends to take a a very dominant left-handed grip on on the shoulder area. And I told him, look, take that grip and and just actually the last time I did Rondori with him, I just wanted him to just be defensive basically, and I told him, look, take this grip. I'm going to grab my grip and I'm going to try and find angles. And I didn't I didn't manage to throw him. He's a lot better than me. But I did manage to get in a couple of really good attacks. I just couldn't really finish it. But the biggest takeaway from that for me was being able to find the right angles. And I look, I, like I said, I couldn't I wasn't able to finish uh because he was playing defensively, but being able to get one solid attack, one inside attack for me against somebody of his skill level was was a win for me it was a big win for me and because I know that by finding those angles I can find success and don't get me wrong don't, I am not discounting the importance of, of of grip fighting I think everybody who is a little bit more proficient maybe sank you and up should be grip fighting and should be acquiring those skills But for me, my goals are to improve my overall judo. And a lot of times, even just from a standard sleeve lapel grip, a lot of the answers in dealing with stiff armors can be attacking the left side instead of attacking their right side, switching it up and attacking their left side from a standard uh, right-handed sleeve lapel grip. Now, I'm not good enough to have consistent attacks going to the left, but I guess my overall 
feeling on that for me, not for anybody else, for me, is that I am looking for answers without having to rely on grip fighting. And those answers are there. It's just about, it's all about improving my movement, improving my timing, and, and improving the my angles of attack and, and just getting those angles right where you know, I get stiff arm all they want. Those arms are going to collapse if, if everything else is in sync for me. Now, for you stiff armers out there, unless you are a competitor or, or somebody who's advanced that's using stiff arms at the right moment, you know, for very, very brief moments, maybe to defend against an attack or so. When I see somebody stiff arming in Rondori, it, it tells me really one thing is that you're afraid to take a fall. Especially in, in the earlier ranks, there's really no such thing as strategic script fighting because at, at, at lower Q ranks, you, you don't really understand the strategies yet. So for you beginners out there, look, I would strongly suggest that you don't stiff arm. And I would strongly suggest that you look to take more falls in Rondori. And I would strongly suggest that if you're looking to defend during Rondori, you really should allow your arms to collapse as somebody is is attacking and defend with your hips. I and I think that was when I was coming up through the Q ranks when I got with my the, you know the, my longtime coach is that he had me stop defending with the arms and he looked for me to or he had me start defending with movement and with hips and even you know movement and hips and and creating my own angles to defend against attacks. Because ultimately, if you're somebody who stiff arms a lot of people, you really are, at the end of the day, impeding your own judo development. And if you're a big guy, you may not realize that because, you know, your stiff arm is allowing you to counter, you know, somebody who may be your size or, or weaker or smaller pretty easily. But that's really not good judo per se, at least not in my opinion. Or what I really should say is that I don't think that's a good way to practice judo in Rondori. Maybe you know, in competition, that's fine. But but in Rondori, I don't think those are good habits to have as, as you are trying to learn judo. All right. I think that's going to be it for me. Uh, before I sign off here officially, I want to let you guys know the IJF put that uh, updated their website, and it looks really sharp. I, I highly recommend you guys take a look at it. I think they did a great job. What I really liked about it, and apparently this was this was the case on the old site, but I never noticed it, is that the site recognizes your IP address and where you're from. So when you go to the main site, you will see athlete information uh, for the country that you live in. So, for example, for me in the United States, as soon as I go on the IJF website, if I scroll down to the bottom a little bit, they've got this widget called... Uh, you, uh, United States at the World Tour. So what's really neat, it tells me the top ranking man and woman uh, for the United States. And that just happens to be Jack Hatton. He's ranked 21st in the under 81 kilos. And Angelica Delgado, who's ranked 13th in the under 52 kilo division. And it also tells me when they're going to be participating next, which is at the Ho Hot Grand Prix in, uh, I believe that's just in a couple of weeks. And it tells me as well that the United States plans on sending 13 judoka, uh, judoka so uh, competitors. So I think that's really neat. I love that. And I, I guess if that was there before, I did not notice that. So it's, it's, it's a nice little widget. They've got the, the American flag. I haven't played around uh, turning on my VPN and seeing you know what it looks like for France, let's say. I, and I don't even know if it would come in in French or, or just in the base English language. I'm not sure if, if it even changes languages based on where you're from. I'd be curious to find out. I think I'm going to try that out. So it's really nice. They've got uh, you know the history, the heroes of judo, uh, the president's corner. They, they probably had all of this before, but every time I went to the IJF site, I just went to news and I just went to calendar just to see um, when the next events are. And anytime I wanted to see who was ranked in what or what the tournament results are, I usually go to judobase.ijf.org. Even though that's all owned by the IJF, whenever I wanted to see that kind of information, I always went to that site. But now on, on the right side of the panel, they've got um, they got the listing of, of number ones in men's and women's divisions. So uh, it's good. It's it's great site. Con congratulations to the IJF. They put out uh, they improved on what they already had, and I think that's a good thing. 
So with that, I hope you all have a great day. I hope you all have a great week. Train hard. Stay safe out there. And until next time, I'm out. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Open Gangnam Style.